this video, I'm going to be introducing some set notation and the concept of probability. So to start off with, we got to understand what a set is. It's just a collection of distinct objects. Uh, and each object in that set is called an element. So anything that you group up, it could be a group of numbers, it could be a group of letters, you could have objects, people, anything that you collect in a group, we could define as a set. Um, and each of the, the pieces of that set, each of the parts, it's called an element. If we have an empty set, uh, oftentimes it's just symbolized with nothing in between two sets of braces, or sometimes we use the null symbol, just a zero with a slash through it. So our set notation is going to involve these braces. We're also going to name sets. We can name them using capital letters. And we can group things together and then talk about the relationship. So let's start off with just coming up with a few sets here. We'll start off with what's called a universal set, something that is a collection of everything that we might want to group up. So we're going to establish that as set u. And that's going to be all of the integers between 1 and 9. So integers are just whole numbers. They could be positive or negative, but we'll just focus on the positive ones between 1 and 9 in this group. So we create a list of those integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. We contain them by putting braces around them, just fancy parentheses. And then we say that it equals whatever the name is. So if we call this set u, then we would put a capital U. We would read this as set u is a group or a set of the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. And then what we can also do is come up with symbols to describe the number of elements in a set. And so we just use an n for number, uh, put the set name in parentheses, and we read that as the, the number of elements in set u. And then we just count our elements and then say what it is. So the number of elements in set u is nine elements. So there's our universal set that we'll start with. And then we'll start to subdivide that into smaller sets here. We'll call set a the list of all the prime numbers in that. So the prime numbers between 1 and 9. Prime numbers being a number that can only be divided by itself and 1, or it only has the factors itself and 1. So we're looking for two parts of the definition. Uh, so the first prime number is 2. It's not actually 1. 1 has a different identity. It's not quite a prime number because it can't be divided by two different things or have two factors. So 2 is the first one. 2 has the factors 2 itself and 1. And then 3 would be the next one, 5, and then 7. And so we have four elements in that set. So the number of elements in set A is 4. Let's come up with one more set. We're going to call this set B. Set B is going to be a list of all the even numbers between 1 and 9. And so the elements of that set are 2, 4, 6, and 8. So let's put them inside a couple braces and label that as set B. The number of elements in that set is 4 as well. So now we have established three different sets here, a universal set and two smaller subsets of that. Let's talk about some relationships between those sets. In order to do that, we got to identify a few more symbols here. Um, so let's start with these middle two. They're the most common for sure. If you see a symbol referring to two different sets, with an upside down U, that's called the intersection symbol. And sometimes we often refer to that as the and symbol. So we're looking for elements in the set that are in set A and set B. So what do they share? What do they have in common? What do they overlap in? And we can also visualize these symbols using a Venn diagram. And so you'll notice that the super shaded area there is representing the intersection or the and between those two sets where they overlap or what they share. A right side up U without a tail, this is the union symbol, also referred to as the or symbol. So these are elements that are either in set A or set B. So we could talk about any of the elements in set A or set B. So really, we're talking about all of the elements in those two sets. The next symbol uh, could be written a lot of different ways. I like to just use this first one where we put a C in like an exponent position, although it's not an exponent. This refers to the complement of a set, and the complement of a set is things that are not in the set. 
So you can also uh, phrase this as a not. So if I see set A with a complement symbol, I know that I'm talking about elements that are not in set A. So that would be everything else in the universal set that's not in set A. And then one more. A sideways U refers to a subset of a bigger set or a smaller set. So this is just taking a portion of set B. And if we define that as a different set, we could call it set C. So set C is just a subset of B. It's elements that are in B that we decided to group together as well. So knowing that, now we can go back and refer to our sets that we set up here and practice those relationship symbols. And then eventually we'll be able to draw our own Venn diagram here. So first let's describe these. Let's describe the set, the union between A and B, set A and B. So that would be all of the elements in A and all of the elements in B and just put them together. So we have the elements 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. That would be the union set of A and B. This is describing the intersection between those two sets. So what do they share? What element is in both of them? Well, the only element that was in both those sets was the number 2. So 2 is the intersection between sets A and B. Another one, for example, we could say what is not in set A or what's the complement of set A. So we would want to name all of the elements that are in set B or in the universal set that were not in set A. So that would be the numbers 1, 4, 6, 8, and 9. And then lastly, more of an open-ended question, describe a set C that's a subset of B. So a smaller set of B, you could really take any of the elements in B and describe them in a smaller set. For example, for an 8, maybe we want to create a subset that's a multiple of 4 in our universal set. But we could really describe anything. As long as we take elements from B and we don't take all of them, because that would be set B, we just take a smaller subset. So just take any of the other elements and you could describe that as a subset. Now that we have that, we can draw a Venn diagram to represent all these relationships. I think personally, when I draw a Venn diagram, I like to work inside out. I like to start with that intersection and then work my way out to the universal set. So we start with the intersection. The things that they share or overlap was the number two. So this circle is going to represent A, this circle is going to represent B, and this box or this rectangle right here is going to represent the universal set, so everything that we talked about. So the intersection was 2. What's left over in A that wasn't in B was those other prime numbers, 3, 5, and 7. What was left over in set B that wasn't in set A was those other even numbers, so 4, 6, and 8. And then what was not in sets A and B but was in the universal set? What's left over that we haven't talked about? Well, 1 and 9 were neither prime nor even. So they're left over. We could put them anywhere in that rectangle as long as they're not in sets A and B. And then if I wanted to uh, visualize a subset of set B, I could circle any of these, as many as I wanted, as long as I didn't circle all of them, obviously. And I could call that subset C. So for example, I said that 4 and 8 were my subset. So if I circle those and label it with a C, then I have a subset or a smaller set inside set B. So there's a visual way of representing the sets that we described and their relationships between them. All right, let's take a break from that for a minute. We're going to talk about probability, and then we'll come back and put it all together here. Probability can be quite complicated the farther you go with it. In this video, we're just going to be talking about the basics. So in a probability experiment, we can have a lot of different things happening. Mostly, though, I'm going to focus on an event. It's just a set of outcomes that we might want. And the sample space would be the set of all the possible outcomes that might happen. So I'm going to focus on those two things in the following. All right, in order to find probability, we're going to set up a fraction or a ratio comparing two things. We could talk about the number of outcomes of an event compared to the number of outcomes in the sample space, although that seems a little complicated. I like to think of it as just the amount of possibilities that I want compared to the total amount of possibilities that may happen. 
for example, let's look at a spinner here. The total amount of numbers that I might spin and hit would be eight numbers, one through eight, right? So I know that out of my total amount of possibilities, I'm going to have eight numbers. Let's describe an event. We'll decide that event A is what happens when we spin a prime number. So down here in this question is asking, what's the probability of event A occurring? So this P is talking about probability, and then we're describing an event or a set. So what's the probability of event A or of spinning a prime number? Well, let's see. How many prime numbers could we get? We got one, two, three, and four. So out of a total of eight possibilities, we could have four of them. So four out of eight could be reduced to one half. A probability could be written in actually three different ways. We could have a fraction form, we could have a decimal form, or we could change that to a percentage. They're all hopefully equal values if we do it correctly. So that'd be the probability of spinning a prime number. Let's take into account another event. What if we spin an even number? All right, so now we can compare those two events. What would happen if we wanted to find out the probability of the union between those two events? Or what would happen if I spun a prime number or an even number? So either can occur. So we got a lot of probability here. Uh, we got the number two is a prime number or an even. Three is prime or even. Four is prime and even. Five is prime or even. Six is prime or even. Seven is prime or even. And eight is prime or even. The only one we couldn't spin was a one in that case. And so seven out of eight possibilities there. In the next case, what happens if we talk about the intersection between those two events? So what would happen if we spun a prime number and an even number? Well, there's only one option there. There's only one number that's prime and even. That's the number two. So we only have a one out of eight chance of hitting that. One more here. What happens if we want to talk about the probability of the complement of event A? So what would happen if we did not spin a prime number? How many options do we have here of not spinning a prime number? Well, one's not prime, uh, four is not prime, six isn't prime, and eight is not prime. So four chances out of eight, that would again be a one half, a 0.5, or a 50% chance. And then sometimes we have questions like, which event is more likely once we've established these questions? And that's just comparing ratios or percentages and just seeing which is greater. So obviously the union would be more likely to happen than the intersection. A lot more opportunity to spin a prime or an even number than just a prime and even number together. All right, so there's an introduction into probability and a little bit of set notation there.